This talk, it's going to be myself. Uh, my name is Trent Roberts. I'm a soil fertility extension specialist with the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. And I'm going to be speaking with Dwayne Beatty. Um, the portion of my talk at the beginning, I'm just going to go through a lot of the different new tools that we've developed uh, to help increase the efficiency of nitrogen management in corn production. And then Dwayne's going to follow up with some of the real world on farm kind of experience that he's had with some of the tools uh, that I'm going to be talking about today. So this is my contact information. Uh, I've got my email and my uh, phone number up here. Feel free to take a picture of it if you guys have got questions. Uh, give me a call or send me an email and I'll do my best to try to address those. So just a few of the things that I'm going to hit on today. I'm going to talk about just common nutrient deficiencies, uh, nutrient uptake and accumulation, and effective nitrogen management, and some new things we need to consider. And then just end with some key takeaways of the best things or the best approaches to effectively managing nitrogen in our corn production systems. So if you think about the uh, Arkansas production system, it's very similar to anything that you would see across the Mid-South, whether you're talking about Louisiana, Mississippi Delta, uh, Southeast Missouri, or Eastern Tennessee. What we tend to find is, you know, these are our most limiting nutrients. Uh, these are the ones that we can typically identify deficiencies in. They're ones that we can typically manage. Uh, nitrogen is always the big one. Phosphorus causes problems both on high and low pH. Potassium, sulfur, zinc, both high and low pH, and then in some areas we're starting to see uh, more issues with magnesium. Uh, this is just an idea of what a 225 bushel corn crop requires. And so a lot of times we think about uh, what's removed in the harvested grain, you know, because that's what's being exported off of our fields every year. But I think a lot of times we fail to realize the total amount of nutrient that the plant needs so that's what's in the grain as well as what is in the biomass. So when you think about that, I've got just a couple columns here with our different uh, elements. We've got the grain content, we have the biomass or the stover content. So this is what would remain in the field and potentially be available for subsequent crops. And then over here on the far right hand side, this is just the total nutrient uptake. So when you think about this 225 bushel corn crop, I mean, we need 250 units of nitrogen to produce that 225 bushel corn crop, right? Roughly 100 of units of those nitrogen remain in the residue, and about 150 of those units are removed in the harvested grain. And so when you start thinking about, okay, well, how do we set our nitrogen rates, and why do they differ in different regions of the country? You know, in Iowa, they grow 200 plus, 200 plus bushel corn with 150 units of nitrogen. You know, we need to apply 220 plus units of nitrogen to get that same yield. Well, the difference is they got a lot more nitrogen in their soil that they can take advantage of. But whether you're in Iowa or Arkansas, you still need that 250 units in to maximize that yield potential. And so I always like to just remind people how the corn crop grows because what this ultimately influences is how and when we need to manage those nutrient inputs. And so if you look, this is just growing degree units here across the x-axis and then we've got the uh, V stages and reproductive stages also listed there. But this is just the dry matter accumulation. So how quickly it puts on leaves, ultimately how much biomass is generated and how it's partitioned between the grain. We've got our tassel cobs, we've got our leaves, leaf blades, different plant portions. Ultimately, once we hit that V6 growth stage, is when we have this huge accumulation of biomass. Everyone that's grown corn, right, you get to that V4, V5 level, you leave for a week and you come back and you've doubled your biomass, right, in a week's time. So it, it happens very rapidly. So we need to keep that accumulation in mind when we start talking about the best places to apply fertilizer and how to manage them effectively. So this is that same graph, but what we're looking at is nitrogen uptake and accumulation. And if you notice, our nutrient uptake, specifically for nitrogen, follows that exact same trend that we see for biomass accumulation. 
Well, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us when we hit that V6 growth stage, we know that that plant is going to have a huge demand for nitrogen through the next few weeks. Well, knowing that, we can better time our application uh, rates and timings to match when that demand is going to be happening in the field to help improve our efficiency. And so I always like to hit on corn yield components. And so if you think about um, the things that contribute to corn yield, there are really four big ones that we need to emphasize. The first one is just plant population, right? The number of seeds that emerge and make a viable plant. I always like to remind people, nitrogen is not going to do anything for plant population, right? So nitrogen can't influence your plant population, right? That's your seeding conditions, your emergence conditions, those types of things. As we move into the season, the next yield component is the number of ears per plant, right? Corn has the potential to set multiple ears if conditions are right, but ultimately that's the first yield component that can be influenced through nutrient management, right? That happens at the V3 growth stage. The next one is the number of kernel rows per ear. So we're typically setting that somewhere about that V5 to V6 uh, growth stage. And then as we start to move later, get close to tasseling, we have the number of kernels per row, and then ultimately we have kernel weight. So if you think about those three yield components that we can actually influence with our nutrient management, specifically nitrogen, it's ears per plant, kernels per row, um, and then ultimately kernel weight. So if you think about these timings, V6 is when we're setting kernel rows per ear. So even though nitrogen is going to influence that, the actual amount of nitrogen the plant needs at that growth stage is very, very small. Right? So I always try to tell people, like, if you got a lab puppy, you, you want it to grow to its potential, but you're not going to feed it like an adult when it's eight weeks old. Right? You want to feed it enough to where it's happy and it's healthy, but you don't want to feed it like it's an adult. And that's what we're doing here. Right? At V6, you only need about 30 units of nitrogen in the plant. There's not a high demand. So really, when we're talking about these early yield components, your goal should just be to keep that plant happy. Right? To where it maximizes its number of kernel rows, and it maximizes its number of kernels per row. And then when you get out here towards the end, we've got kernel weight. Well, that's just grain size, right? How big are those kernels? Do they fill out effectively? And we can influence all of these things. But what I'm trying to lead into is this idea of when these yield components are set versus when the plant actually needs the nitrogen. So if we talk about just generally Nitrogen management is typically, right, nitrogen fertilizer is required in the greatest quantities to maximize corn, uh, corn grain yield. It's often the hardest to manage, right, if you think about environmental conditions, you think about all those factors that go into effective nitrogen management, it can be tricky, right? We can't put all of our nitrogen out pre-plant and successfully grow a corn crop. We know that. But what's the flip side of that? Well, if it starts raining at V4 or V6, it's really hard to get back into the field with ground equipment. So then we've got to rely on aerial application. And so there's no silver bullet that's going to answer all these questions. But if we educate ourselves about timings and the best way to do things, well, anytime we can do that, we're going to see a benefit. I think of all the nutrients, nitrogen has the greatest opportunity for return on investment when we manage it properly. So just to go back to a similar graph and really emphasize this idea that about 50% of the nitrogen is taken up after R1. So if you just look at this graph and you look at the R1 growth stage, we see that about 50% is taken up before that and 50% is taken up after R1. So if the plant's taken up half of its nitrogen after R1, how much benefit do you think we're getting out of pre-plant nitrogen? How many weeks are there between your pre-plant nitrogen application and R1? 
there's a lot of weeks. There's a lot of potential for loss, whether it's leaching, denitrification, immobilization. There's tons of things in the soil competing for that nitrogen. And the longer you leave it out there, the more of it's going to be lost. I always try to tell people, if I want to give Jason a $100 bill, I'm not going to lay it on this desk and expect him to come back in a month and it'll still be there. Right? That's what you're doing with your nitrogen fertilizer. You're putting money in the soil and you're trusting that it's going to still be there a month or two later for that plant to come by and pick it up. And so that's kind of what we're working towards. So corn yield response to nitrogen timing. I'll be the first to admit, I show this data for the sensational quality of it. This data set is not meant for you to take it away and say, okay, I can wait until VT to put out all my nitrogen. That's not the point of this. This study was set up to where we put out the season total in rate in one application at these different timings. Right, so the check is where we put out no nitrogen. So that would be your yield if you didn't apply any nitrogen at all. Pre-plant would be 220 units of N, pre-plant incorporated. V10 would be 220 units of nitrogen, where the plant did not receive any nitrogen until V10, and then everything got put out at V10. So what I'm showing you here is that at least in these four locations, you could wait all the way to V12 and not put out any nitrogen prior to that and put out 220 units in these fields and maximize corn grain yield. How many people would think, okay, well, I could wait until V10 or V12 and I could put out 220 units and still cut 250 bushel corn? Probably not very many. Do I recommend that? No. I do not recommend that. Part of the reason I want to show you this is just to give you that kind of new look or new mindset to these really early season applications. We're not getting nearly as much benefit out of them as we would think. And it all goes back to when does the plant actually need the nitrogen and when can we put it out, right? This isn't something novel. I mean, Missouri has done this research, the upper Midwest, they've done this research. We're just showing that in the Mid-South, the window of opportunity to apply nitrogen fertilizer is a lot larger than we probably have previously thought. So, something that we're kind of working towards is a flow chart for how we manage nitrogen in the Mid-South. And we want to start with soil texture, and we want to consider like our silt loam or lighter textured soils and our clay textured soils because that's going to give us our base rate. Right, 220 versus 290 units of nitrogen. On a silt loam, we want to look at pre-planting incorporated about 30 to 45 units. We want to move to side dress and look at 115 to 145 units. We want to collect ear leaf samples somewhere around VT to R1. And then that tells us, do we need any more to finish out that crop? Right? So to start with a small amount pre-plant, has come back heavy at side dress, right? Here we're at 50% uptake. So we're going to take a leaf sample and say, okay, do I have enough to maximize yield from this point going forward? And then, right, based on that tissue concentration in the ear leaf, we can say if we're greater than 3%, we don't need any more additional nitrogen. There's enough in that plant to maximize yield potential. But if we're less than 3%, then we know that what we would traditionally consider like a pre-tassel application is truly needed to go ahead and finish out that crop. Then at the end of the season, we want to look at collecting corn stock samples right at maturity, and then we can interpret those corn stock samples as an end of season report card to tell us how well we actually did in that field the previous year. So what I'm going to do is go through kind of each of these different tools quickly and just kind of indicate uh, how we can use them. So let's just talk about the scheme. Here's my nitrogen uptake curve in my corn crop. Ideally, right, I want to put out 30 to 45 units pre-plant incorporated. And I want to wait as late as I can to put out that side dress application. 
that's going to be dependent on your production system and what you can manage. But the further in the season we can move that side dress application, the more efficient it's going to be and the bigger return on investment we're going to get. Now every situation is a little bit different. This pre-tassel, right? I think in the beginning we need to decide do we want to do a three-way split or do we want to do a two-way split? I think that comes down to producer preference. But at the end of this talk, I hope what I've kind of highlighted are the different tools that you can use to help make these decisions, right? Because more information I typically think is better. And if we're informed about the status of our crop, we can do a lot better the timing and the management of these applications. So this is just another study that we've done, uh, looked at four locations. And what we did was just different scenarios, right? Different application strategies. We've got our zero where we don't put out anything and these numbers represent our pre-plant application rate, our side dress application rate, and our pre-tassel application rate. So here we've got zero pre-plant, 220 side dress, zero pre-tassel. Here we waited until pre-tassel to put out the entire 220. And then we've got these two which I think are really the strategies we need to be considering. Either a two-way or a three-way split. So in this two-way split, we're putting out that 30 pre-plant incorporated, that V6 to V8 growth stage, we're coming back with either one or two applications to give us a side dress total of 190. We get down here to this one, we've got 30, 145, and 45, so we're just automatically putting out that pre-tassel. But if you see, those two strategies are top two in terms of yield and return on investment. If you look at these two here in the middle, what you'll find is if I use that same season total in rate, but I go real heavy on this pre-plant, even though I'm putting out the same rate, I don't get the same yield potential across all locations. Why? Well, if you look at pre-plant, that is our least efficient timing or our least efficient application. I can guarantee you, regardless of the rate you apply, you're going to lose 50% of your pre-plant nitrogen. That's just the way it is. The plant's not big enough to utilize it, and you've got too many competing factors for that nitrogen, whether it's loss, soil microbes, all different types of things. So anything we can do to reduce this pre-plant and put it in season, we're going to increase efficiency, we're going to increase our return on investment. The next thing that we've done is really looked at tissue nitrogen in the leaf as a predictor of how we need to manage nitrogen in those later vegetative growth stages as well as reproductive. And so if you look at all the work that we've done, the magic number is 3%. So once you hit the V10 growth stage, you want to maintain a tissue nitrogen concentration greater than 3%. And if you do that, you know that you have optimal nitrogen to maximize yield. So I get a lot of questions like, okay, well, let's say I go out at V10 and I take a leaf sample and I've got 3% nitrogen. What do I need to do? Well, if you're at V10 and you're at 3%, that tells you you've got adequate nitrogen in the plant but you probably need to put some out because as that plant continues to grow, what's going to happen to that nitrogen concentration? It's going to drop, right? But if you're at V10 and you're at 3.5% nitrogen, chances are you're set for the rest of the season because even as it puts on biomass and it dilutes that nitrogen and lowers the concentration, you're still above optimal. But what this gives us is it gives us a threshold and tells us between V10 and R1, we want to stay above that 3% line. And as long as we stay above that 3% line, we can be assured that nitrogen is not going to be limiting our corn yield. So the next thing is the corn stock nitrate test. So we've been doing a lot of work with this in Arkansas and the Mid-South. It's a post-season tissue test, so it doesn't do anything to help you for the current growing year but it's an end of season report card that basically tells you how well you manage nitrogen in that field during the year. Now, not something new, right? They've done this in the upper Midwest, New York, all across the eastern seaboard. 
The difference is in our production systems where we irrigate and where we have different soils, we have to have our specific thresholds and concentration ranges. So the one thing I want to really point out is the numbers we use here are going to be very different than you see out of the Midwest or other uh, non-irrigated corn production systems. But the nice thing about this is we can take our ear leaf samples and our CSNT and pretty closely match our nitrogen management. If you have those two pieces of information, I can almost guarantee you, you're going to know how well you manage nitrogen in your field. And so it's just about what tools are available, what information can we gain from those tools, and then ultimately how does it influence our management going forward. So if we move on, the one unique thing about the CSNT that we've developed, which no other state has been able to do, is we can use that value to estimate how much you over applied nitrogen. And so this is something I'm actually really excited about because what it does is it says, okay, I can take your CSNT value from that end of season and I can look at the concentration and I can tell you how much you over fertilized. So in this particular situation, if you had a CN CSNT of 4,000 parts per million, that means you had 160 units more nitrogen than you actually needed to maximize yield in that field. So granted, that doesn't help you for the current production year. But what it does tell you is the next time you put corn in that field, what are some things you can do? What are some adjustments you can make to reduce that total in rate or to get closer to what you actually need? Now, right? We've got sites all the way up here where we were applying 250 units too much nitrogen. Not everyone is going to fall into that category. But if you're in here and you're in a, an excessive or an above optimal category, and we can save you 50 units over 1,000 acres, and you're still maximizing grain yield, those little savings can add up significantly over time. Uh, this is just an example. I'm just going to point out a few things. I know Dwayne has several of these examples that, that he's going to highlight. But this is just a report from that CSNT. So you can see the samples that you send in, what the individual uh, concentrations are. We give you your average, and then we just have a management suggestion. And as an example, I used excessive. Uh, we're going to change this to above optimal, right, with the idea that if your CSNT values are this high, you put out 120 units of nitrogen more than you actually needed. That's a significant cost savings that you can potentially realize uh, down the road. Switch gears real quickly. Anybody that's using surface broadcast urea, we need to be thinking about urease inhibitors. And so uh, in certain situations, um, I think there's potential that ammonia volatilization loss can still be significant, especially on our high pH soils. Uh, these are all the different products that we've tested and recommend as uh, urease inhibitors. If something's not on that list, chances are we just haven't tested it. And so, you know, if you've got a product that you're interested in, let us know and we can try to get it and test it. The one thing that I'll tell you is regardless of the product, it all comes back to active ingredient. And so if you're thinking about active ingredients, most urease inhibitors use NBPT, and the percent concentration highly impacts our use rates. So if you think about the original Agritain, it was about 20% NBPT, and that's why we recommended four quarts per ton. When you look at some of the newer products, uh, they're up around 26% NBPT, so you can get by with about three quarts per ton. Some of the latest stuff that's coming out is very high concentration, anywhere from 36 to 50% NBPT. You can get by with two quarts per ton of urea on those, right? But it all goes back to the active ingredient and the proper rate to uh, effectively eliminate that ammonia volatilization loss. So. In irrigated corn production systems, I think the majority of producers are probably consistently hitting their yield potential, right? When you think about an irrigated production system, I would say most producers 
you're not going to see a 50 or 100 bushel yield increase from some management practice, right? I think in our irrigated production systems, specifically corn, where we have the greatest benefit is increasing our efficiency. So maintaining that yield potential with less inputs. And I think nitrogen is one of those places where we can make some huge gains in efficiency, get some big return on investments, and become more profitable. Corn is not as sensitive to early season nitrogen as we would like to think. You know, I'll be honest, when I started working in corn in Arkansas, people said, well, if I don't have 100 pounds out pre-plant, I'm already in trouble. And, you know, I don't know anything about corn, so I didn't know any better. So I said, well, why don't we test it and see? And when you go through all this stuff and you think about when the plant actually needs the nitrogen, and when we do the research to show that pre-plant's not very efficient, well, we learn really quick that it's not as sensitive to that early season as, as we have previously thought. Um, so keys to success with pre-plant. I don't think you ever want to put out more than 45 units on a silt loam soil. Remember what I said earlier, you automatically assume you're going to lose half of that, whether you put out 30 units or whether you put out 90 units. I got a question, do you need to add that half back in to your total nitrogen to hit your 220 mark? Nope, you don't. What I would recommend is, well, so you, you probably should put it at your side dress or your pre-tassel. But I think what you want to do is experiment in your situation. And so go ahead and maybe leave it off of your side dress and then take that tissue sample and see where you're at. And if you're at three and a half percent at V10, then what you cut out at pre-plant you don't need. But if you're at three percent at V10, then that pre-tassel is going to do you a lot of good. And so I wouldn't just automatically add it. I would say, okay, well, let's go out and take this, gather more information before I just automatically put it out. Um, I think we want to incorporate pre-plant nutrients. I don't care if it's nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, or zinc. If you're not taking the time to incorporate it, you're not taking full advantage of those nutrients. It just goes back to placement and availability. Um, I just put these diagrams up here to just visually give you an idea of that. When we surface broadcast flat and pull beds, all those nutrients are in the bed. When we pull fresh beds and broadcast, it's usually pretty evenly distributed. If you have stale seed beds and you broadcast in the spring, where does all of that fertilizer go? It goes into the furrow. Now, it's not necessarily gonna be lost, but if you look at our research, it takes to V8 before the corn roots are down there to get that fertilizer in the furrow. So if you put it out, broadcast on stale beds and don't re-pull the beds, you're not getting any of those nutrients till V8 because the corn roots aren't down there. If the roots aren't down there, it can't get the nutrients. Um, so when we talk about side dress, my emphasis is just going to be a wide window of opportunity. Don't, don't tie yourself to, I've got to have it out by V4, or I've got to have it out at V6. To me, it's about getting the, the timing right, getting the rate right, and I mean, I think in a lot of cases, if you manage it correctly and you have to put it out by plane, even though that application cost is a little bit more expensive, you're going to get a bigger return on that investment than if you just say, I've got to knife it all in at V3 because that's the last time I can get across the field with my UAN rig. If you actually pencil out the return, the cost, later in the season is going to be better. Incorporation, either through rainfall, using a knife rig, or irrigation, the sooner we can get that nitrogen below the soil surface, the quicker it's going to be available for plant uptake and ultimately <coughs> the higher efficiency we're going to see. So, wide window of opportunity to apply nitrogen in corn. We want to move more in season to improve efficiency. We want to use different tools to ensure maximal yield potential. Phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, and zinc are critical for high yielding corn. I think the biggest misstep that I see in row crop production, whether it's corn, rice, cotton, whatever, is you put out nitrogen for 250 bushel corn 
but you don't put out zinc for 250 bushel corn. That makes absolutely no sense. Because the money you spend on nitrogen for 250 bushel corn, if you don't put out zinc for 250 bushel corn, and you only cut 150 bushel corn, all that extra nitrogen, you just pissed away. So if you're not managing these other nutrients for your high yielding production system, all that extra you're putting out in nitrogen, you're just wasting. And so pay attention to these other nutrients. Be smart about when and how you cut rates. I think one of the most underutilized things we have, especially in Arkansas, is poultry litter. Anytime you can get your hands on poultry litter, it's a great, it's a great nutrient source. A lot of times the nutrients per unit are much cheaper than what it would cost you with synthetic fertilizer. And the P and K is immediately plan available. Acknowledgements, I just want to thank the Arkansas Corn and Grain Sorghum Promotion Board. All the research that I've done and kind of showed and talked to you about today has been directly supported uh, by the funds administered uh, by that board. Um, I'm just going to put this up real quick so you can see it, and then I'm going to switch over to uh, Dwayne's presentation so that he can uh, start his The three and a half percent for the nitrogen, you know, before your pre test was shot. Since it's a percentage, is that based on whatever yield goal you, you are shooting for? No. Or is that three and a half percent for a 225? What? So when you look at those nutrient concentrations in leaf tissue, basically what you're saying is it's kind of like taking your temperature, right? Like I can tell if you have a fever whether you weigh 150 pounds or 350 pounds. That's the way you have to look at tissue concentration. Okay, so three and a half percent. If I've got three and a half percent at pre-tassel, what is my yield? What, what yield per, what yield potential are you saying that three and a half percent is efficient for? So what I would say is three and a half percent. You can cut 400 bushel corn with three and a half percent in the leaves at R1 or B12. But you got to realize the problem is you've got so many other factors that control it. Very rarely is nitrogen your limiting factor in an irrigated production system. Hot nights in June and July are yeah. what kill our yields. Nitrogen doesn't do anything for that. What's your opinion between dry and 32%? And so I think there's no difference. So nitrogen is, is what about nitrogen. Loss in between those two? Um, so I don't think there's much difference in loss. You know, when you do UAN 32%, I think there's a little more potential for loss just because a quarter of that nitrogen is nitrate. So if you put out UAN 32 and you get a big rain, there's a chance you could lose that. With urea, you're not nitrate yet, and so you've got a little bit more time before you have that denitrification loss that you might have with the nitrate in UAN. Even if it's knifed in, yeah, just because when it gets waterlogged, that's when you're going to start losing that nitrate. What about plant life? spoon feed. After you put out 45 units pre plant or 50 units pre plant, and it gets to be three, just on a pound irrigation, you know, every week, so or I, rain or irrigation up to hassle. I mean, I think if you have a pivot and you want to fertigate, you can do that effectively and cost effectively. Yeah. If you're not using overhead or sprinkler irrigation. Well, if you're using an airplane, they're charging you about a pound anyway. So yeah. if you're going to run 350 pounds, why not split it three times instead of one time? You could, but, but I think when you pencil it out, if you're going to use an airplane, if you go out at V8 or V10 and put it all out at once, it's no, no, I'm, talking, I'm saying, yes. no, that's, okay. that's yeah. what I'm yeah. saying. It's better to just put it out in one big one zone. If you go late, yeah. if you go early, you want to split it up. Well, and the thing about burning corn early in the season is it's purely cosmetic. So I mean, those leaves you got to realize after a couple weeks, those leaves don't even see the sun anymore. So even though they're burned, it's not influencing your yield potential. No, just because your order is a magnitude difference. You know, when you're talking about nitrogen, three and a half percent, you're talking about 20 parts per million of zinc, and they're just so far apart.
225. I would just say whatever the soil test recommend, recommends is the optimal. I'm going to find a place to set out of the way. Sorry. Okay, I'm Dwayne Beatty. I'm a crop consultant from South Arkansas. Uh, this will be my fifth growing season, so I'm pretty old before I started consulting. Had 30 years experience, so I thought I knew a little bit of something about growing a crop. I know now I don't know nothing, uh, you know, and it's the, the, the main aspect of growing corn, is, as Trent has said, is nitrogen management. Although when we start looking at nitrogen management, another thing he said, mentioned was PK, zinc, sulfur, all of that's got to be in, uh, in supply also. So the, the one thing about nitrogen that is, is so problematic is the potential for loss either through volatilization or or leaching and that's that stewardship management that's come into play so so importantly is another factor uh in the, the nitrogen management uh i'm stealing this from trent i'll tell you now trent i'm stealing a couple okay. of slides but uh you know it, and this was what i saw some of the what he was presenting in 2018 but for for years before that he was telling us to pull back the pre-plant nitrogen that we put on these crops because of the simple fact of corn cannot take it. And he's, he's talked about that. So uh, just to, to move our, our nitrogen more in season. And then this really caught my eye was the fact that, uh, you know, we can still have 50% of our nitrogen uptake after that R1 growth stage. So in 2018, visiting with Trent, we talked about these tools for, for nitrogen management. Uh, I implemented the, the ear leaf tissue samples and corn stalk samples on seven fields. Now I'm just presenting data from, from four of these fields uh, today, but as we look at uh, these first two fields, both of these fields are on the same grower. Both fields were done exactly the same way. As you notice here, uh, this first field, the CEC is eight, so it's kind of a sandy field. I was real concerned about nitrogen loss in that field. And then you look at this other field, CEC of 15, just a good solid silt loam field. Uh, and the, the uh, thing about these fields, now even though, well, they're grid soil sampled, so I went in on the a two acre grid and collected these samples, thought I would be helping on reducing the variability of these samples. Uh, and also, that was a way I could, could, uh, could, could carry it back to, you know, something maybe we could correlate back to. But as we look through the, the nitrogen management on this, this grower, when I first started working with him, he was 90 units of, of nitrogen pre-planted. We got him down to 60 units, uh, and I wanted to get him on down lower, but he, 60 units is where he's at uh, right now. But... Uh, so we put out 60 units, and then he's 32%. And I'm a little bit fond of 32% liquid nitrogen also, or 28005, either that, but I, I like liquid nitrogen. But he puts out a good slug at the V3 to V4 range, uh, growth stage, which is 90 units, followed it up with the urea and ammonium sulfate. Uh, and then I've always implemented a pre-tassel nitrogen for the last several years. Uh, I, I think that's a good way to split our total nitrogen and irregardless of, of what the total nitrogen is, we implement that uh, pre-tassel pre uh, nitrogen. Now one thing that I did do in 2018 after seeing the, the data that Trent was showing about the uh, 50 percent, 40 to 50 percent of the nitrogen uptake is after that R1 growth stage I had been with our pre uh, with our pre tassel of coming in at V12 to V14, you know, somewhere 10 to 14 days before you'd ever see a tassel coming in the field, and that's when I'd put it out. So that year in 2018, we went to just a few days before tassel emergence and, and put out the uh, pre tassel. But on that field, on them two fields. His total nitrogen is in is staying in that 240, 245 range. So as we look at the ear leaf samples collected from that field, we see here in, in the sandy field with the CEC of eight, it was three and a half. 
and then we get into the good silt long field, it was still at 3.39. So very good tissue samples, which I was expecting that because we had already put out the preseason uh, pre-tassel nitrogen when we pulled them samples. So I was really thinking that we was in really good shape on that. And then when we look at the, the corn stalk nitrogen results from this field, this is the sandy field. We're in excess. And that really surprised me, me in that fact of being that excessive. And if you all remember, 2018 was a fairly wet year, and I thought we had lost a lot of nitrogen, especially on our sandy fields. But uh, we certainly was in ex excess of that. So in the, the field with the uh, CEC of 15, again, we was pretty high on our nitrogen, but we was in that optimum range. So felt good, but let me put another disclaimer out here. This is one year data, and I don't put a whole lot of faith on just one year of uh, samples or something like that, and that's where I had every intention in 2019 pulling samples on the fields again and at least having a couple of years to, to make any changes or whatever. But, well, 2019 wasn't kind to me, and I wasn't able to get the samples pulled. Now, one thing that, that we're going to sit down with this grower, but we've already been talking to him, and really work on reducing his preplant nitrogen. I, I really feel like now that that is something that even, even with him balking at that, we've still got to do that. We've got to reduce that front end nitrogen. And then I think even with reducing just 20 units of nitrogen on that field, we'll still be in optimum uh, range on our, our corn sample, uh, our corn nitrogen stock samples at the R6 growth stage. So uh, that was them two fields on the same farm. We look at uh, two more fields on neighbor farms now. Both of these growers, the soil texture is very similar. It's a, a prairie type silt, silt loam soil. And the CEC on both of these fields is eight, so it's, it's thin soil. And this soil is, is very, it, it, it doesn't hold nutrients well and you can't build nutrients. Uh, but this grower is, is really on board with re, uh, low amounts of pre-plant nitrogen, but then going into spoon feeding through the, uh, through the year. We come in as soon as we can row it good and put out some urea and ammonium sulfate, then come back with two more mid-season applications of urea. All of these are with, you, with a urease inhibitor, and then we come in with our pre-tassel to get him up to that total of 226 pounds of nitrogen uh, on this, this ground. Then this other grower, on neighbor grower, similar, very similar soil texture. Uh, we're at 40 pounds of pre-plant, and then we have two splits uh, through the mid-season with urea and sulfate, and then coming back with some urea at that V8 to V10 growth stage, and then our pre-tassel. So again, we're in that 223, uh, total nitrogen, uh, total pounds of nitrogen on, on them fields. If we look at our tissue samples, where we really spoon fed the, uh, the nitrogen on this first field uh, and had the, the very low pre-plant nitrogen, we're at 3.25%, uh, so we're over that 3% critical range. Now on this field that uh, we had the higher amount of uh, pre-plant nitrogen, the 40 units of nitrogen pre-plant, we're right there in it, there at three. So I thought, well, still, we're in good shape. When we look at the, the corn stalk samples, this is one thing that, that we're, we're all worried about on this soil texture. It's just this, we just can't hold nutrients, whether it's nitrogen, PK, whatever. We, we when we, well, back up. We see we're in that, that five, so very low. Even though at the uh, tissue sample we were 3.25%, uh, we lost some nitrogen there. And, and again, uh, again, this it's one year of data here, so I really wasn't, I was wanting to get another year in here also. And then if we look at that other field where we uh, had the, the higher amount of nitrogen out pre-planned, again, similar in that 45, what I'd like to do on these fields this, this coming year, I want to bump that pre-tassel nitrogen and see if we can get 
with, with having adequate nitrogen levels at our ear leaf tissue samples and then increase our pretassel from the 46 pounds of urea and of nitrogen and increase it to that 69 pounds of uh, nitrogen in, in them fields. This, this other field, I, I consult the soybeans on, on this grower. Uh, he, he pulled his own corn stalk samples. He, he didn't get uh, ear leaf samples, but pulled corn stalk samples. He had a cover crop in there on this field. And if we look at this in uh, this field, if you see, you notice one thing, it is some sandy ground, CEC of six. He had two timings that he terminated the cover crop on part of the field and then the other part he terminated it, terminated the cover crop at planting uh, and we've got the corn stalk samples from them two uh, termination dates. But is he, this grower is one of the most organized there is. He has an iPad in every tractor when he goes into the field for an application, he sets that application in there and when he leaves the field he stops it. So. It really surprised us when we, we had uh, some question on some of the, the nitrogen on it, but he is real adamant on uh, the real low use rate of nitrogen, and the only nitrogen he puts out is, is it is in his infer application with some, some potash, uh, with two pounds is what he starts off with, and then certainly comes in with ammonium sulfate, and then has two uh, applications in the mid-season and then comes in at an early pre-tassel at V12 to V14 uh, with, with urea. So he's had a total on this ground of 240 pounds of nitrogen. Now, again, he didn't have, he, he thinks, he, he knows he put out the 57 units of nitrogen. He thinks he may have even went to 69 units at this application. So he had at least 240 units of nitrogen uh, on this field. So we look at the corn stalk samples that was taken from this, these fields. This is where the uh, cover crop was terminated seven days prior to planting. He was in that optimal range. Um, to me, I think that's an ideal range. We're above the critical, but we're not way above. Uh, and then as we look at the cover crop that was terminated at planting, in this part, we was at 29, so just a little bit low, but again, I, I kind of wish we'd have had tissue samples to, to know where he was at mid-season and to, to, to have that other little bit of data. But again, uh, this is just some, some data that he asked if I was interested in, and I said, yeah, I'd like to, to look at it and see. So that's what I've got. I certainly appreciate the work of the university system and, and all of the help that they provide us. Uh, certainly the corn board for the funding. And this conference is one of the best conferences there is. And uh, with that, I'll take any questions if, if we have time. Yes. I guess my, my thoughts have changed on getting, having to get the corn planted in you know, March, early April. You know, but we got rice in the mix. And, if we don't get our beds up in the fall and roll down, you know, can't count on getting the corn planted. So as far as incorporating that tree plant, if you're putting in furrow with that with that nitrogen, you're putting in furrow, uh, you know, carry it along until it can grab the, that, that fertilizer that falls down in the middle. And that maybe some you are trimmed. Well, the, the in fur, but if you really wanted to get a lot of nitrogen, I'd go with the two by two uh, side dress. The, what yeah, I mean, I think if you're going to true in furrow, you got to watch your application rates. Yeah, you if can't. you go to a two by two, you can get up to 20 units and still be still be fine. But anything you can put out at planting is going to do a big benefit to get you to that V8 growth stage when the roots actually hit the furrow. Yeah, that's a, in in an area in stream southeast corner of Arkansas, stale seed bed is the norm. They're always gonna be stale seed bed. And what them growers are doing is, as soon as they can row the corn, because 99% of that is soybean corn rotation, so they, they have some residual nitrogen. So as soon as they can row it, if they're not using a two by two uh, side rig, and they come in with their liquid nitrogen as close to that, that bed as they can, and knife some nitrogen in. So can I ask a yeah. quick question? Yeah. So regardless of what the tissue sample said, I mean, 
did you feel like those yields were good in the fields? Yields were, were adequate. Uh, and, you know, in that two, 200 to 225 to 230. So even the growers on this thin prairie soil that uh, have been concerned, well, they've actually limited the nitrogen they put on the crop because they just haven't been able to see a response. Uh, but, but they was even in that 200 bushel range and they're generally their yield is 180, 170, 180. So I feel like they, I'm hoping they weren't limited to nitrogen. And again, that just goes back to the simple fact of one year data. And I, I really wish I would have gotten the samples in 2019. Yes. Trent was talking about earlier on the stale seed bed and losing that fertilizer. Did you see whether him had the cover crop? Did that crop seem to yield to get that fertilized quicker, even though it's you know, did that hold did the cover seem to hold that fertilizer and him putting the the uh, two units there in furrow, did it did that corn seem to maybe hold itself better? Well, I can't say for sure because I don't consult this corn. So I, I can't say, I, I drive by, he, what, his, his older consultant is cutting back on acres, so I took the soybean acres, so it may be a couple of years before I move into the corn, so I, I'm sorry I can't answer that question. I didn't know if Trent had seen that. Either. Well, so what we've seen is, is where you're doing cover crops and you're terminating at planting, you want to put those nutrients in furrow below the ground. If you put them out, you know, broadcast on a growing cover crop, they grow in the, they go into the cover crop, and the problem with nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur is anything that goes into the cover crop, you don't get back until it decomposes. And so that's not necessarily a bad thing, it just changes the timing of when you get those nutrients back. And so, like, if you're using a cover crop, uh, if you're terminating a planting, I would encourage those in furrow or two by two applications because then you know the corn's going to get it, not the cover crop. What if you terminate your cover crop? Yeah, if you're doing two or three weeks before, then it just comes down to that broadcast on the surface and then it tends to stay more distributed. That's what he and so it doesn't go into the furrow. Yeah, that's what he And so you do get it you do get it quicker because it stays where it lands. That's what we seen and I would ask you Yeah. We we started really heavy cover. So all our most all of our corn was cover crop last year and we put the we went to in furrow at the same time. You know I went it was and we it didn't, where we didn't have the in furrow, you can see it plain as day. You, you know, even though we put the P and K and urea out at planting, we had killed the cover as quick as we could and it was already dead. So it seemed like it took it in the ground should have leaked. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, to me, uh, putting out broadcast on cover crop is the same as like a, a, fresh, a fresh bed. You know, I mean, we've all seen where you've got stale seed beds and you broadcast your PK nitrogen. I mean, it all just bounces and rolls. But where you've got residue, whether it's cover crop or previous corn residue, it stays wherever it wherever it is. Oh, so I just want to remind everybody: if you need the CEU credits, here's the the sign in. Yeah, this whole day is so in the 98 to 2002, and it sounded like a lot of soil, but I, 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 think, I think you were down. I have a couple questions. Yeah. <laughs>
I switched because of you know, a lot of people what I know of this company. Yeah. Okay. Well, so it's, I've got to go got his hand talk to Dr. Slayton real quick okay. before yeah. he heads back to Fayetteville, but I'm going to be here all night all all okay. and okay. tomorrow. Just, uh, so do you guys have a booth or anything? No, we didn't. Well, uh, they're, they're booked up. But, uh, well, do you have the same number? Yes. I've got a new number, but I have the same number too. Oh, okay. I have, I have two phones now. Um, it's a curse. I've got some stuff I think you're going to be really interested in. Okay. It's, uh, it's technology that we use on our fertilizers. So, I mean, that's the number I have. Yeah, and that's, 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 that's my personal number. Okay, so I yeah, you okay. can give me any okay. one of them. But uh, what we do is we take our uh, liquid fertilizer and use them in what we call the flavanol technology. It's a, a plant-based polymer. So what it does is it has negative positive charge, so you don't have the leaching high in the ground. And uh, uh, the, the, uh, the bacteria in the ground gets away and slowly, so it's a slow release. It stays with the plant longer. So when you get a minute, you sit down. So is it mainly in furrow, starter, side dress? Starter. You put it two by two, in furrow. You put it out drip irrigation, you put it out, I mean, any way it goes out, it can go out. I'm going to go out to my truck and get a few things, and then, how long do you think you'll be? Um, hopefully only about 10 minutes. Okay, yeah, uh, I'll text you about 30 seconds. All that stuff early, sometimes I have it a month before we plant it, so then we'll try to add 
we're just dumping nitrogen, trying to think what we're covering, what we think we lost, and how this past year I was up around 280, and I still didn't make no corn. I mean, made the same. Yeah, huge. I'm not I'm I'm not I'm not I'm not i I'm not I'm 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 I'm Oh, I think that was mine. At least the worst thing is you put out eggs all in, but you're not short your stuff. No, probably when I pull them around. I mean, that's better than, you know, putting it there. Mother's hard to come by. I don't need to leave it on. Like you said, don't leave it on. I mean, if you've got that kind of money, I'll be glad to hold on to it for you. I got four kids. I don't have that kind of money. Me and you both, mama. And we work for a living. Yeah. No, I never arrived. So, yeah. Southeast, yeah. So, Linky does a lot in Chico, Deshay County. Okay, so across over yeah. Greenville. Yeah. Are you familiar with Agrilet? Uh, a little bit. Uh, what's uh, what kind of rates? What what products do y'all? We have? make MP and K. Uh, uh, bio stimulants, uh, micronutrients. Uh, we make full line gamut of everything. It's all different. But what differentiates our uh, different fertilizers than other? We, uh, in case of what's called flavanol technology, what that is is a polymer plant-based uh, coating that goes over the, the liquid uh, molecule. Okay. So you don't have the uh, the uh, positive and negative uh, charges. Okay. It don't leach. It does not volatilize. It's Plants able, uh, very low salt index. You're able to get it closer okay, to the root. Okay, so it doesn't have much salt in it. It's there. very low. It, uh, closer to the root, plant able to take up 85 to 90 percent of, of, of what, what's supplied. And uh, we've been in business for 40 years. Huge out in the Midwest, up north. We've had some problems in the southeast just for the sheer fact that they've never put the right man down here. They've always put the guys from up north coming out here and try to sell southern boys. Yeah. Didn't work out. They finally figured it out. Hired me. I'm done. Research with Trent for years and years. Okay. Trent's a good friend of mine that done stuff with uh, uh, Mississippi State, Dr. Golden, okay. uh, 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 Dr. Dodds, uh, Trent, uh, Jeremy Ross. Okay. So I like. Where are you based out of? I am based out of Mississippi, but okay. I cover Arkansas, Mississippi, Boot Hill, Missouri, and Louisiana. I have a lot of sugar cane in Louisiana, so but I'd like to come out and talk to you one day, or if you got some time. While you're here, sit down and okay. show you a few things. Yeah. Uh, sounds good. Yeah. Always interested in something like that. Yes. Make it, yes. Make it easier on the grower. Yep. Yep. Do you have a car? Or? No. Okay. no. Let me just uh -huh. let me get you information that way. Well, I'll, I'll take it back. A little bit cheaper. I think I had saved I'll, sh one. I'll shoot you. Oh, I thought I'd one card just for what's that? 870 Yeah, I'm in the, the I'll be in the, the book there. Oh, okay, yeah. I I I can look you up in the book then. We got a merge. That's what I'll do. But, uh, yeah, and that's, uh, yeah, I'll be interested in, in visiting and uh, just seeing what uh, what products you'll have, and especially, yes. like I'm going to get some stuff out. got somebody down here that knows what you're doing. Yeah, uh, so important. I tell you who we uh, distribute through this. Uh, Marvel, Arkansas. That's probably the closest one to you. Uh, farmers Co-op up yep. there. Yeah. Yep. It sells quite a bit of our product. Uh, county line. Uh, but, yeah, I, I need somebody down and, and, and there's a guy that sells nature right there on the other side of it. Gilbert. Is it Gilbert? I can't think of his name. Yeah, right under the overpass. How close is he to you? He's in my area. Well, I'll just talk. Yeah, well, I'll send yeah, you I'll text you here. You, yeah, I just called you, so that's, oh, that's, that's okay. my number right there. Good deal. It, it's short.
What? How's that oh, stopwatch? Yeah. I'll get out of your hand. I'll talk to you a little bit. That uh, retirement stopwatch. How's it, how's it ticking? Yeah, and it's not projecting the whole thing, but uh, it's cutting the bottom off. Uh, Cuts the top. Change these batteries before I get ran over. There we go. All right, appreciate you. Oh, you bet. We we'll see you. Once you finish, I'm gonna get beaten. Wayne, you gonna woo us today? <laughs> Not now. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out. You know, I'm old school. These little fancy things here, it cuts it off. So we'll just do the best we can. Then, uh, you didn't. Know. It cuts the top and the bottom off, but that shouldn't be a problem. It just cuts the bottom of the slides and the top of the slides all. It's good, but it's like it's in focus. Is it looking focus to you? It could be a little sharper, but I don't know how to... I'm not focusing anymore. You're here to focus right here. It's so sensitive. I got old fox light and that's so good. It's on a little trouble here. Turn the trap out. Wayne, I didn't, I didn't know if your, your boss was going to let you talk for a while. Oh, here's my boss, Trent. Oh, he's always like it. I've got that new Yeah. Right <laughs> two, three, two, three years ago, I was in the same room with him. And, uh, he, he left me less time that year. <laughs> but yeah, I've got used to it. Yeah. Oh, uh, Focus thing over here. There's a focus, but yeah. But I don't see how to make This is a small enough room to have a work. Chico can do it. What, uh... Oh, 2019? Yeah, I'll sit here for a while. Just 2019. This is overall... It's overall... So 60, okay, so okay. your seating rates on there, or the, are your seating rates? Okay, that's seating rates average across in rates and reps. So what, what yeah. kind of population, are those pretty close to the final populations? No, no. I don't have final populations. These were the seating rates. Uh, and so you see. So 10, take 10% 10 off or 5% off? Of those At least 10. Yeah. Especially, the higher the seating rate, the more it's off. He's just. You know, I, I've seen that. I can't. I can't tell if it's actually the planner or my arrows can't count. 
No, I think it's, I, I, I don't think it's the plan. I think it is the competition early. Um, well, but I mean, you know, but the thing is, okay, let's go up to the skill set, the presenter, and the resume, Okay. If, if, if a bag costs $300 a bag, and you put out 35000 seats, it's going to cost $131. If you put out 65000 that same is going to cost you $243.75 an acre. Okay. You go down here, we recommend two forty. dollars that big deal? Okay, you go up to three twenty. You go from, and of course that's the price across there from 200, 250, 300, 300, all that being said. Okay, you take that situation. So you can, if you go 320, okay, our top was 65,320. So that's at $300 a bag, we're paying more than that. But 243.75 plus 125, you're at $370. It's all in bag. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not even, I mean, I did it because that was the protocol, but gold uh, is this a decal, Pioneer, what, what, what This is actually a decal variety. Um, See, I think it is uh, 70, 20. Yeah, there's a 70, 20. There's a 25 and a 27. I bet, yeah. I, I think it's 70, 25. But, I mean, you see, but, you see, what, what I did, okay, I put the nitrogen at 120 pounds previous to that. Then I came back as pretty small and put up another 120. So now everything's got. 240, and you're looking at plant population, everything's the same. Okay, now, I come back in and put another 40 pounds out there as the latest I can get through the field. Five to six leaves to age. And I put that on on half the field. So now I've got, I've got 120, I mean 240 and 280. And then I come back at three tassels and put another 40 pounds out there as you read. You know, because people think they're taking that advantage there. Well, and my data shows you can't if your end rates are low. Yeah. But if your end rates are where they should be, but all it says is is that if you're if you in a situation where you could have lost my then we've shown that you can go as late as as fast and get a response. As long as you get, as long as you get incorporated, as long as you read why the plant needed it. Right. Maybe you only put 200 units out there. All right. Or, or you, uh, you know, you put 120 out of the range and rain and rain and you got hot. Then it went from this tall to this tall in two weeks. You can't get through there. So, so now I've got 240, 280, 320. So that's how I got my rates right there. So everything had 240 on it to start here. And that's the way I think it should be. Because you're trying, I'm trying to see what happens if I ask for more than what we recommend. Now this is behind beans too. Now in 2019, it was behind peanuts, peanuts, and soybeans. So it had three legume crops in a row on there. And so, now what's interesting if you look, okay, this is, oh wait, yeah, next year. okay, this is single row versus twin row. Significantly difference in favor, now this is averaged across all seeding rates and no interaction between seeding rates and, and, and uh, row spacing. But, okay, we've got about a four bushel or five bushel increase in favor of single rows in that year. Now let's go down and look at well, yeah. This is uh, 2018, 25 bushel in favor of twin rows. Now look, I mean, look at your end rate effects. 255.2, 255 255.9, 255.8. Now that's average across all those reps plus 
seating ratio. So how much end rate effect you got there? I mean, there's less than a bushel range there. Now, the other difference, you don't see it over, I mean, you see significant difference between the two, you know, A's and B's. But, so I, I put the main effect for single row versus twin row. When I come back again, okay, now I've got one year single row, one year twin row. So what do you do? Third year goes back the other way. But the two years of single row together do not equal the difference in that one year between the other two. So, you know, our contention is, is that with twin rows, the deal is that we've been up in the seed rate on twin rows with 37, 375. Good beds, okay. We're taking that planter. Okay, if our yields are equal, we run that planter across more acres. We've got the area shaded more rapidly. So you may be able, so you put in effect on 38 inch rows, you've got 38, 38, 38, 40s, you've got 30, 10, 30, 10. So, you know, we basically create a 30 inch row. Now in corn, we ain't going back through there either, other than push out there at night and bring out. And a farmer may not do that. They may put it all out at once, but I was trying to stagger it here, but you know, in this year, it ended up coming out that, it, that, that, um, that twin rows. And again, all three years has been significant. But two years favored single rows, uh, I just favored twin rows. I guess I, I, I never so saw, saw a like lot of difference. That, I mean, if, uh, if I didn't, if the beds were a little soft, or, you know, along the edge of the bed, uh, singles all the time. You see, that's a true lie. And yeah. if I, I feel like if I did it right, yeah. then it's yeah. not and I argue with them and argue with them, but they, they stay mad at me. Yeah, so still, I yeah. contend that the problem is the same we're drawing this the hipper west yeah. because, oh, what yeah. I, the no, I know. because what I end up with, I'm going to take the rope here. Yeah. And um, there you go. Think about Arkansas. This is you get a, might not a ridge, it's not flat. Uh, well, so, but I get, I mean, if I talk about associate professor. This sucker's not, and it's this wide. And it's, uh, this one you haven't touched. Like okay, so when you plant, well, okay, like to me it doesn't single row, you can see it here, and you can place it here. Well, in a single row, okay, I'm going to at least get it about into the same point I'm going to go over here. Not over here. So these rows, and if this is my or is one, your harvest, my harvest rows are those two. And so, I mean, not, so we, we got the hipper kind of does the same thing that, you know, if you, if you, if you, I'm taking the tape measure out of this. The twin rows are lined up where they're supposed to. They line up in the furrow, the tractors, right, yeah, you know, they play, so cinch down uh, tight. Let me ask you a question. And uh, this one's 41 inches, and this one's 30. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Exactly. And even on. So that's a roller bed. That you know, the thing had a field cultivation is a roller bed. Mm -hmm. There's always a row that's soft. Uh, so in other words, they look perfect. My understanding. You get a soft row. But, but then you get a rain on it, just like what you're talking about. Oh yeah, you got, down the side. You yeah. got one of them that's held up fine, this one's fine, and then this, this one's gone. Slept away. George Ray Walker, who I worked with, 
The first work I did was on farm. All my clean road work started was on farm. And George Ray was probably working on clean roads and over for new guys coming. We had the first nitrate test. So we've been doing a lot of work with this in Arkansas and the Mid-South. It's a post-season tissue test, so it doesn't do anything to help you for the current growing year, but it's an end-of-season report card that basically tells you how well you manage nitrogen in that field during the year. Now, not something new, right? They've done this in the upper Midwest, New York, all across the eastern seaboard. The difference is in our production systems where we irrigate and where we have different soils, we have to have our specific thresholds and concentration ranges. So the one thing I want to really point out is the numbers we use here are going to be very different than you see out of the Midwest or other uh, non-irrigated corn production systems. But the nice thing about this is we can take our ear leaf samples and our CSNT and pretty closely match our nitrogen management. If you have those two pieces of information, I can almost guarantee you you're going to know how well you manage nitrogen in your field. And so it's just about what tools are available, what information can we gain from those tools, and then ultimately how does it influence our management going forward. So if we move on, the one unique thing about the CSNT that we've developed, which no other state has been able to do, is we can use that value to estimate how much you over applied nitrogen. And so this is something I'm actually really excited about because what it does is it says, okay, I can take your CSNT value from that end of season and I can look at the concentration and I can tell you how much you over fertilized. So in this particular situation, if you had a CN CSNT of 4,000 parts per million, that means you had 160 units more nitrogen than you actually needed to maximize yield in that field. So granted, that doesn't help you for the current production year. But what it does tell you is the next time you put corn in that field, what are some things you can do? What are some adjustments you can make to reduce that total in rate or to get closer to what you actually need. Now, right, we've got sites all the way up here where we were applying 250 units too much nitrogen. Not everyone is going to fall into that category. But if you're in here and you're in a, an excessive or an above optimal category and we can save you 50 units over 1,000 acres and you're still maximizing grain yield, those little savings can add up significantly over time. Uh, this is just an example. I'm just going to point out a few things. I know Dwayne has several of these examples that, that he's going to highlight. But this is just a report from that CSNT. So you can see the samples that you send in, what the individual uh, concentrations are. We give you your average, and then we just have a management suggestion. And as an example, I used excessive. Uh, we're going to change this to above optimal, right? With the idea that if your CSNT values are this high, you put out 120 units of nitrogen more than you actually needed. That's a significant cost savings that you can potentially realize uh, down the road. Switch gears real quickly. Anybody that's using surface broadcast urea, we need to be thinking about urease inhibitors. And so uh, in certain situations, um, I think there's potential that ammonia volatilization loss can still be significant, especially on our high pH soils. Uh, these are all the different products that we've tested and recommend as uh, urease inhibitors. If something's not on that list, chances are we just haven't tested it. And so, you know, if you've got a product that you're interested in, let us know and we can try to get it and test it. The one thing that I'll tell you is regardless of the product, it all comes back to active ingredient. And so if you're thinking about active ingredients, most urease inhibitors use NBPT and the percent concentration highly impacts our use rates. So if you think about the original Agritain, it was about 20% NBPT and that's why we recommended four quarts per ton. When you look at some of the newer products, uh, they're up around 26% NBPT, so you can get by with about 3 quarts per ton. 
Some of the latest stuff that's coming out is very high concentration, anywhere from 36 to 50% NBPT. You can get by with two quarts per ton of urea on those, right? But it all goes back to the active ingredient and the proper rate to uh, effectively eliminate that ammonia volatilization loss. So, in irrigated corn production systems, I think the majority of producers are probably consistently hitting their yield potential, right? When you think about an irrigated production system, I would say most producers, you're not going to see a 50 or 100 bushel yield increase from some management practice, right? I think in our irrigated production systems, specifically corn, where we have the greatest benefit is increasing our efficiency. So maintaining that yield potential with less inputs. And I think nitrogen is one of those places where we can make some huge gains in efficiency, get some big return on investments, and become more profitable. Corn is not as sensitive to early season nitrogen as we would like to think. You know, I'll be honest, when I started working in corn in Arkansas, people said, well, if I don't have 100 pounds out pre-plant, I'm already in trouble. And, you know, I don't know anything about corn, so I didn't know any better. So I said, well, why don't we test it and see? And when you go through all this stuff and you think about when the plant actually needs the nitrogen, and when we do the research to show that pre-plant's not very efficient, well, we learn really quick that it's not as sensitive to that early season as, as we have previously thought. Um, so keys to success with pre-plant. I don't think you ever want to put out more than 45 units on a silt loam soil. Remember what I said earlier, you automatically assume you're going to lose half of that, whether you put out 30 units or whether you put out 90 units. I got a question, do you need to add that half back in to your total nitrogen to hit your 220 mark? Nope, you don't. What I would recommend is, well, so you, you probably should put it at your side dress or your pre-tassel. But I think what you want to do is experiment in your situation. And so go ahead and maybe leave it off of your side dress and then take that tissue sample and see where you're at. And if you're at three and a half percent at V10, then what you cut out at pre-plant you don't need. But if you're at three percent at V10, then that pre-tassel is going to do you a lot of good. And so I wouldn't just automatically add it. I would say, okay, well, let's go out and take this, gather more information before I just automatically put it out. Um, I think we want to incorporate pre-plant nutrients. I don't care if it's nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, or zinc. If you're not taking the time to incorporate it, you're not taking full advantage of those nutrients. It just goes back to placement and availability. Um, I just put these diagrams up here to just visually give you an idea of that. When we surface broadcast flat and pull beds, all those nutrients are in the bed. When we pull fresh beds and broadcast, it's usually pretty evenly distributed. If you have stale seed beds and you broadcast in the spring, where does all of that fertilizer go? It goes into the furrow. Now, it's not necessarily gonna be lost, but if you look at our research, it takes to V8 before the corn roots are down there to get that fertilizer in the furrow. So if you put it out, broadcast on stale beds and don't re-pull the beds, you're not getting any of those nutrients till V8 because the corn roots aren't down there. If the roots aren't down there, it can't get the nutrients. Um, so when we talk about side dress, my emphasis is just going to be a wide window of opportunity. Don't, don't tie yourself to, I've got to have it out by V4, or I've got to have it out at V6. To me, it's about getting the, the timing right, getting the rate right, and I mean, I think in a lot of cases, if you manage it correctly and you have to put it out by plane, even though that application cost is a little bit more expensive, you're going to get a bigger return on that investment than if you just say, I've got to knife it all in at V3 because that's the last time I can get across the field with my UAN rig. If you actually pencil out the return, the cost, later in the season is going to be better. Incorporation, either through rainfall, using a knife rig, or irrigation, 
The sooner we can get that nitrogen below the soil surface, the quicker it's going to be available for plant uptake and ultimately <coughs> the higher efficiency we're going to see. So, wide window of opportunity to apply nitrogen in corn. We want to move more in season to improve efficiency. We want to use different tools to ensure maximal yield potential. Phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, and zinc are critical for high yielding corn. I think the biggest misstep that I see in row crop production, whether it's corn, rice, cotton, whatever, is you put out nitrogen for 250 bushel corn, but you don't put out zinc for 250 bushel corn. That makes absolutely no sense. Because the money you spend on nitrogen for 250 bushel corn, if you don't put out zinc for 250 bushel corn, and you only cut 150 bushel corn, all that extra nitrogen, you just pissed away. So if you're not managing these other nutrients for your high yielding production system, all that extra you're putting out in nitrogen, you're just wasting. And so pay attention to these other nutrients. Be smart about when and how you cut rates. I think one of the most underutilized things we have, especially in Arkansas, is poultry litter. Anytime you can get your hands on poultry litter, it's a great it's a great nutrient source. A lot of times the nutrients per unit are much cheaper than what it would cost you with synthetic fertilizer. And the P and K is immediately plan available. Acknowledgements, I just want to thank the Arkansas Corn and Grain Sorghum Promotion Board. All the research that I've done and kind of showed and talked to you about today has been directly supported uh, by the funds administered uh, by that board. Um, I'm just going to put this up real quick so you can see it, and then I'm going to switch over to uh, Dwayne's presentation so that he can uh, start his The three and a half percent for the nitrogen, you know, before your pre test is shot. Since it's a percentage, is that based on whatever yield goal you, you are shooting for? No. Or is that three and a half percent for a 225? What? So when you look at those nutrient concentrations in leaf tissue, basically what you're saying is it's kind of like taking your temperature, right? Like I can tell if you have a fever whether you weigh 150 pounds or 350 pounds. And that's the way you have to look at tissue concentrations. Okay, so 3.5%, if I've got 3.5% at pre-tassel, what is my yield, what, what, yield per, what yield potential are you saying that 3.5% is efficient for? So what I would say is 3.5%, you can cut 400 bushel corn with 3.5% in the leaves at R1 or B12. But you've got to realize the problem is you've got so many other factors that control it. Very rarely is nitrogen your limiting factor in an irrigated production system. Hot nights in June and July are yeah. what kill our yields. Nitrogen doesn't do anything for that. What's your opinion between dry and 32%? And so I think there's no difference. So nitrogen is, is nitrogen. Loss in between those two? Um, so I don't think there's much difference in loss. You know, when you do UAN 32%, I think there's a little more potential for loss just because a quarter of that nitrogen is nitrate. So if you put out UAN 32 and you get a big rain, there's a chance you could lose that. With urea, you're not nitrate yet, and so you've got a little bit more time before you have that denitrification loss that you might have with the nitrate in UAE. Even if it's knifed in. Yeah, just because when it gets waterlogged, that's when you're going to start losing that nitrate. What about called spoon feed? After you put out 45 units pre plant or 50 units pre plant, and it gets to be three, just on a pound. At irrigation, you know, every week so or I, rain or irrigation up to hassle. I mean, I think if you have a pivot and you want to fertigate, you can do that effectively and cost effectively. Yeah. If you're not using overhead or sprinkler irrigation. Well, if you're using an airplane, they're charging you about a pound anyway. So yeah. if you're going to run 350 pounds, why not split it three times instead of one You could, but, but I think when you pencil it out, if you're going to use an airplane, if you go out at V8 or V10, and put it all out at once. It's no, no, I'm, talking, I'm saying, yes. no, that's, okay. that's yeah, what I'm yeah. saying. It's better to just put it out in one big one. If you go late. Yeah. If you go early, you want to split it up. 
<laughs> well, and the thing about burning corn early in the season is it's purely cosmetic. So, I mean, those leaves, you got to realize after a couple weeks, those leaves don't even see the sun anymore. So, even though they're burned, it's not influencing your yield potential. There's some binoculars of zinc ratios that you like to work those out of the soil test. No, just because your orders of magnitude difference. You know, when you're talking about nitrogen, three and a half percent, you're talking about 20 parts per million of zinc, and they're just so far apart. I'm saying I would just say whatever the soil test recommend in, recommends is the optimal. I'm going to find a place to set out of the way. Sorry. Okay.